All right, let's do this. Um, welcome to the Writer Center's virtual craft chat series. Um, this is where we talk a little bit with writers about, I guess a little less about what they wrote or what they wrote about, and a little bit more about how they wrote it. So we focus on the craft of writing. My name is Zach Powers. I am the uh, director of communications at the Writers' Center, as well as a fiction writer, I write stories, and I published a novel as well. So uh, that's why I'm the one here speaking with our guest today. And I want to welcome E.C. Osandu to the chat with us this evening. Uh, E.C., thank you so, so much for joining us. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Very excited. Great. Um, so you, you have your book handy. And just before we get started with, with a q and I did just want to ask you to read a, just a, a brief excerpt from this book so that anyone who maybe hasn't read it yet has an idea of, of, of what we're talking about and what they have to look forward to when they get a copy themselves. Right. I'll, I'll keep it very brief. I'll read from a story called Memory Store, in which the protagonist goes to sell his memories. Um, I'm not a poet, so I won't give it too much of an introduction. I'll just read the story. <laughs> um, one of the things he found most fascinating about America were the memory stores that could be found on almost every street corner. A person could simply walk into any of the stores and sell their memories for money. It was that straightforward. He had come to the real realization that certain things were undoubtedly straightforward in America. Take American beers, for instance, with their twist off caps. Twist, twist off caps may not seem like a big deal to most American beer drinkers, but he remembered buying a cold bottle of beer back home and bringing it to his room and ransacking the entire room in search of his bottle opener. He eventually found the bottle opener on the line, on the line underneath a pile of old newspapers. By then the beer was already lukewarm and tasted flat on his tongue. Even in matters that did not seem straightforward, he still admired America. He loved the fact that in America, there were a dozen different kinds of donuts. There were even donuts without holes. Back home, he had grown up knowing only one kind of donut, light brown with a hole in the center. He recalled his first time in an American donut store. I want a donut, he said to the sales clerk. Which one of them do you want, she asked. He had pointed vaguely in the direction of the glass display case. The sales clerk looked at him and began pointing out and reeling off the names of the different kinds of donuts that they had. Glazed chocolate, vanilla, frosted, powdered sugar, old fashioned. Looking at her, he had pointed at a light brown donut with a hole in the middle. Honey, you mean old fashioned. Why didn't you say so instead of messing with me? She sounded relieved and laughed. The coffee laden atmosphere had lightened. He too had laughed. He had repeated the words, old fashioned, and had vowed to commit it to memory. Thank you. Thank you. And that was from Alien Stories. Again, please buy a copy of the book. The link is in the chat window. So EC, um, just real quickly in your own words, as an introduction to before we get to the book specific questions, who are you? Who are you for the, all these people here to know as we go forward? Okay, my name is Isi Osandu. Um, I was born in Nigeria. I was raised in Nigeria. I came to the United States to attend grad school at Syracuse, where I studied with um, a couple of better known writers like Mary Gitzkill and George Saunders and really great people. Uh, before I came in my past life, I was actually an advertising copywriter. So I worked with an agency that has 250 offices worldwide called the Ogilvy and Mather Agency. So I started out as a copywriter, which interestingly too, uh, was the job of some famous writers today like Salman Rushdie. He also started out as a copywriter mm -hmm. and uh, that was how I started. But I came to grad school to Syracuse to, to, uh, to do the MFA in creative writing program. Mm -hmm. That's and, great. Uh, I didn't know your marketing background. So that's also fascinating as that's part of my job. So I, when you named that, when you named your, your firm, I was like, oh yeah, obviously. I'll give you a myth. Yeah, they're still known. And in fact, when I, it's surprising that even after 15, 20 years, one of the commercials I wrote for a brand of tea is still running on radio, you know, after all these years. So it make, kind of makes me happy. And um, I also found out that there's something that celebrates advertising in America. It's called the Super Bowl. You know, the advertising is the real thing. The game is just in the background somewhere. So I follow the, the advertising and the commercials in the Super Bowl. I, um, I, 
eventually uh, finished from Syracuse and has taught a, a bunch of, a few places. I taught at the University of Maryland very briefly uh, before I came to Providence College and I live in Rhode Island. I have won awards for my work. I won the what is referred to as the African Booker, but it's not really the African Booker. It's called the Kane Prize uh, for my short story, Waiting, which was in 2009. I've also won a Pushcart Prize, a Pushcart Special Mention, and a couple of other prizes uh, and awards. Uh, my short stories have been translated into many languages, uh, including Icelandic and Japanese. I have also uh, published a book of short stories before Alien Stories, titled Voice of America from HarperCollins and a couple of other publishers. And I also published a novel Title This House is Not for Sale, which has been published here and published in a, a few other countries as well. Um, recently, before Alien Stories came out, I published a novel in Italian. I don't write, I don't speak Italian. But it's only been published in translation in Italian, and hopefully it comes out here at some point. But it's set in Italy, so it's not surprising that it's been published there first. I, I didn't. Hope that covers everything. Yeah. I, I, I didn't know about the Italian novel, so that's also that's also fascinating. I, I don't know if I've ever heard of an uh, of a writer publishing their work in translation before the English version was published too. So that's that's unique. Pretty unusual, yeah. So the first question I want to ask is what we usually ask last. So this is now the first question after being the last question. Mm -hmm. What's the one big piece of advice you give to an author just starting out? I'll give many. Okay. I think I'll give many. I, I think that the, the first thing I have to say is uh, never lose your passion for writing, for the writing itself, not for publishing, not for the fame, not for the money, not, just the passion that you have, that love that you had for it that propelled you into it, never lose it. I think that's the most important thing so that the passion is always there. You come to the page like, uh, someone who's looking forward to something that they love to do, you know, because there is nothing that quite matches that. You might get all of those things later. You know, you might get all those things that you thought were really, really important later. And you might not even think that they are really important. You, you would, you will enjoy them. Let me not, you know, um, one of the things that happened in my publishing career was that, you know, when I was in grad school, the Atlantic used to run a contest for students you know, the Atlantic Monthly, they run a, a contest in poetry and fiction for students. And when you won, you got maybe $1,000 or $500. And that was such a big deal. But I never worked up the courage to, to enter any of my works. But a few years later, I had a short story published in the Atlantic, you know, and they paid good money. Very, in fact, it was a happy day in my house and with my agent then, you know, we were very happy. But uh, that was that, you know, that was good. It lasted, the euphoria lasted for a while. But after that, you still have to come back to the writing, the joy that you have for the writing. I think that's the most important thing. All the fame will come. If, if you're fortunate enough, it may not come, but don't ever lose the passion. That I, I'm always excited when I get to the page, when I start a new project. It's like, this is, a, this is the greatest one. I'm really happy and I throw myself into it. I think that's one. The other thing is, something that I, I may be having a Mandela moment here, but I, I always think that it was George Saunders who said it in Syracuse, but I'm not sure he did. But it sounds like the kind of thing he'll say, which is that in writing as a writer, it's really important to lean on your strengths. To lean on your strengths, that if you lean on your strengths and focus less on those things that you can't do well and focus more on those things that you can do well, then you probably just it's going to be it's going to make the writing life easier for you okay so let's say you're a dialogue person so be a Hemingway write dialogue driven stories instead of trying to be a Faulkner you know just focus on that which you can do well lean on that and you know really mine it but if you keep saying no I don't want to be that kind of writer I want to be this kind of dense descriptive writer you know who spends five paragraphs on the scenery then you're going to just have a life of writing that's unfulfilled and unhappy and just very difficult and very laborious. You know, so that's, for me, 
you know, maybe it's from my advertising background. It, the easier way is always what you're encouraged to do. You know, so that's, I think that's, that's it for me. The passion, keep that passion, keep that enthusiasm going. That's great. And I, I think too, that if you ever have a piece of writing advice you heard somewhere and you don't remember who said it, mm -hmm. just attribute it to George Saunders. And it's probably somewhat accurate. It sounds like the kind of thing he will say, yeah, you know, it's very Zen. It's very Buddhist. It's very kind of kind, you know, it's kind and it's generous. So yeah, if you say he's the one who said it, that's, that, that works. If it's not right, no one's going to call you on it. They'll just assume. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the next next series of questions I wanted to ask you were about collecting stories or putting together a story collection. So uh, sort of from individual pieces. Yeah. Um, so the name of this collection is Alien Stories, and there are a lot of stories where the aliens are characters or referenced or something alien is involved uh, and really in all, I mean, all senses of that word, but sometimes very literally in the extraterrestrial sense, or at least the implied uh, that. So how did your alien stories become a single project? Were there individual stories first, just some thread you were, you were working from um, and then you decided to keep going or was this a book length, book length kind of project or at least an extended project from the start? There was no project at all at the beginning. There was really no project. I was just a guy who was uh, in a very awkward situation. So I'll explain. My agent had, had written a novel. Um, you know, my first two books were sold in a two book deal. So I didn't have to worry about a publisher. They were just waiting for me to submit the, so. Uh, so by the time I was done, I wrote a novel and um, I sent it to my agent you know, and she made the right noises, you know, oh, I love it, it's great. And then she was going to start sending the novel around to editors. And as you probably know or not, um, it's a very harrowing process. The period, you know, between which you wait for the test results to come out for something you suspect might be uh, a very horrible health condition is the only thing that's comparable to it. You know, so um, I was, she said, oh, you know, you have to wait. Uh, it's in the summer and editors, you know, some of them are on break. They'll get around to reading the work and you'll hear back. So it's either like I start twiddling my toes or just, you know, doing something that might not be very healthy. So, uh, and I like to read short stories. I like to write them. So that was what happened. So to fill the time, I decided to write a short story, you know, so I wrote Memory Store, okay? And I think I also wrote um, Alien in Actors. So when I wrote the two, I just thought that there was an interesting pattern here. And then I wrote uh, Fist. So I told, I called up my agent and I said, oh, I, I started writing these short stories. And she said, you know, when I signed you on, you, were, you only had short stories, you know, and you didn't even have a novel. So, you know, I like to read your stories. So send them along. You know, I like to see them. You know, I said, any news about the novel? She said, not yet. So I sent, <laughs> yes, that didn't help. So I sent, I sent the stories along to her and she read them. And then about two weeks later, she said, oh, you know, I've placed three of them. Yeah, you know, you know, Taste Magazine is doing a summer fiction issue, so they like that one about Fist. Uh, Guernica, who you've published with before, like this one. These other people, Trip Any Review, like this one or something. So, so I was like, oh my God, uh, what just happened here? <laughs> you know, so yeah, that has, that has never happened with my work before. Like they just went like that. So I, that was when I realized, oh, I might be onto something. And I also realized that, you know, this has really kind of taken, moved me away from becoming absorbed and, you know, weeping into my tea or crying into my tea or saying, oh, woe betide me. I've not been able to sell this other book. So that's when I started putting the stories together. Mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting, just a point I want to share, which is, um, so uh, when I got my agent, I was, I had already published my story collection and I was selling a novel. And so my agent doesn't place individual stories. So if you're a story writer out there and it's important for you to place stories, bear in mind that not all agents 
place individual stories. Some only sell books. And this is not a criticism. My agent is great. She's fantastic. That's not, I didn't mean that as a criticism, but just that's where I was in my career. So stories I wrote later, she wasn't able to help with though. So that means I was still myself submitting every story I write. I'm still through the same process that all short story writers are going through uh, at, at the beginnings of their career. So that hasn't changed for me. Yeah. So, um, so what compelled you to keep going? What, what, what was the, what was the motivating, what, what inspired you with this, this project? The stories were sold. They sold quickly. I got some little money. <laughs> That's always a great motivator. Um, I got some little money for them. They were sold. But it just made me realize that, well, maybe I'm onto something here because of the fact that they sold quickly. You know, so I said, oh, and then I began to think of the fact that I also had a couple of stories in my folder that I had not published, but they were somehow within the, the what I call it, the general um field of this of the stories here and that's when i began to think you know if you're not if you're not an immigrant the word alien might not mean the same thing to you that it means to me for instance you know um so if you are not a u.s citizen if you're a permanent resident you're known as a resident alien if you are on a student visa, for instance, which is what I had when I came to the US, mm. you're referred to as a non-resident alien. These are all things that are encoded. You know, if, if you're doing your taxes, these are the questions that, you, are you a resident alien? Are you a non-resident alien? These are all things that are enshrined in the paperwork that you do. So that's certainly a word that hits different, that kind of reminds you of your outsiderness. You know, um, for the longest time in the United States, students from other countries were actually called foreign students. Again, reminding you of who you are, that you're foreign to this place. Uh, but I think out of political correctness, that name has evolved now into being called international students, which again, still kind of alienates you, but not as uh, in the same way like foreign students does. So it's not, it's, uh, so I began to think of it in those times. I also began to think of alienness in terms of the way we would view it, you know, those who are in the United States and how they think of the word alien, you know, and all the warm and fuzzy movies that have been done, we come in peace, you know, and all of that. So I began to think of all of those two. And remember, I just later, you know, of course you theorize later, but later I also began to think about the fact that science fiction has always been a tool with which you can criticize society and society kind of is so taken by your story that the criticism doesn't hit as hard as it would have hit if you were writing an essay like Baldwin or you were engaged in some kind of polemic. So that was something that I found uh, very interesting too, that I could use you know, science fiction in a way that it's not like Asimov but also in a way that makes me able to talk about some of these things that um, alien and alienation and an alien nation in ways that I couldn't talk about them, you know, if I was using any other tool. I mean, it's, I, I love the way that the book goes between the extraterrestrial alien definition of the word alien versus the international definition of the word alien, sometimes within the same story. Sometimes I felt like it took me a minute to realize which, which version of that word we were actually dealing with before I got, so I love that. I love the fact that throughout the compilation of this, the cumulative effect of all these stories, that word was actually, I won't say muddied, but fogged. So I didn't always know which version of the word I was going to be entering into. And that's a really uh, effective thing for me as a reader that the, a collection can do that a single story maybe couldn't have. Um, I've always liked the um, the concept. I think it's probably Hemingway who pioneered it. You know, a story collection titled "Men Without Women," in which all the men were literally without women. That's where hills like white elephants come from, where the guys live in the woman. And later, my professor at Syracuse, uh, Mary Gitzke, has a story collection called "Because They Wanted to," in which the characters actually want something or they do stuff out of their own volition or they have agency to do stuff, which ordinarily, you know, some characters don't have. I think it was Vonnegut that says your character should want something, even if it's just a cup of water or a drink of water, you know. So I've always liked that and this whole idea of 
you know, aliens began to just kind of come together. But you know, there is also something in writing and, you know, story collections and novels. I don't know whether it happens to others, but I just believe that once you are within that kind of creative zone that you begin to attract like a magnet, you know, some filings begin to come to you, you know? So when I began to do this, I also began to think of some of the stories that I had published that I'd written earlier, you know, debriefing, for instance, I published it years ago, you know, and then it just kind of fit this project out of nowhere. And that was like, you know, that was a relief and that was like gravy. I just really loved it. That's great. So I was, when my story collection came out, maybe the question I was asked the most Mm -hmm. was about the order of the stories within the book. And I always felt a little bad because my answer was, I didn't really think about it that hard. I just like, I mean, maybe I made a lot of mixtapes as, as, as a kid, as, as a teenager. And so I was comfortable with like the arrangement of like figuring out arrangements of things. But I was like, this was just the way I, I tossed them in a document, moved around a few if that felt right. And I was done and never looked at it again. But apparently that's a, a, a big concern for a lot of writers. And so what was your organization process for the collection? How did it come to this particular shape? I remember my the guy who edited uh, Voice of America, my first collection, saying that he wants a situation where the stories start in Africa and ends in America, like most of the characters there. And so I, that was at the back of my head. And so for this one, I said, I want a situation where the story starts in America and ends in Africa. So if you look at the last story, it's actually these guys who are at the cusp They are the guys who want to move, who want to travel to Europe or travel to the United States. So that was just the only kind of reasoning like I had. And I said, well, if he's going to do it that way, I'm going to do it in reverse. That was it. That was the the main thing that I did with arranging the collection. Yeah. Do you have any any general advice for putting a story collection together at any point of the process, I guess? Anything from concept to just collecting maybe some included, you mentioned a work you included that was older, recognizing that it fit. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, I, I think that you shouldn't like deliberately set out, set out to say, you know, I'm going to write a story collection called Yellow in which all the characters are cowards. But have at the back of your mind that you, you know, mm-hmm. probably that at some point there has to be some organizing principle to the stories. I don't know if, if you know what I mean. Um, so that still go out and write your stories. Still write the stories as they occur to you. But at some point, I think that when you're putting a collection together, just like a poetry collection, you know, you want to think of, it might, the thing might be just something that is ineffable. It might not be some big, it just might be that all the characters are angry young men. Okay, so that becomes the thing that holds it together. One of the things that I was really worried about was sameness. I wasn't, I was really worried that the story, I didn't want the stories to be semi so much so that, you know, but I wanted you to move from one to the other and it's a different experience and there's a different experience and there's a different experience. And then at the end of the day, there's something that kind of makes it cohere. But, you know, that's that's the advice. I, I think that, when you put a collection together, even when you've written the stories uh, you wrote one 10 years ago and you're writing one now, that when you really try to organize it and think about it, you can theorize it. You can theorize it and realize, oh, there is something. You know, I never thought about it, but there is something that holds all this, uh, the collection together. And that's how to build a collection. I mean, I think too, that as, as writers, there are things that hold us together and make us who we are as writers. And if you can identify that, that's what pulls, I mean, in, in, you have the alien thing, which makes it very, I mean, simpler in a way, because no one's going to question the unity of all these stories. In my case, I, I write weird stories. I have a weird fantastical element. Oh, that's, that's it. That's it. That's what holds it together. Yeah. 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 So I th- sometimes I think it's way simpler. Like you're addressing themes that interest you. You're writing in a way that interests you. You're, you're thinking in a way that interests you. And that's going to carry through everything you write. So that theme, that connection is always going to be there. And uh, Fantastic. You know, think about the fantastic. You just theorize it very quickly. So, yeah. these are, so these are weird stories. These are fantastic stories. These are stories of dark humor. 
So that holds it together much, even though you're not like asking yourself, is there a character named Jack who is 18 here, who's 30 there, who's, you know, that, that doesn't have to be. That would be more constraining than anything else. I will say that my collection, there's, I think, a character named Natalie shows up three times uh -huh. just because that was my placeholder name. Whenever I didn't have a character's <laughs> name, I, just stayed, I never changed it. So, yeah, that's, that's, I, that's like, I don't know. I just, that was that's a good name for a character. Actually. It's just, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I did want to talk about your path to publication a little bit because we, we sometimes don't talk publication in these events because it's not purely a craft subject, but since, uh, we both were recipients of the Boa Short Fiction Prize. We both won that prize. So uh, my first book, my story collection, was published by Boa. And this is your third book, uh, third in English, because there's the Italian book as well. Uh, and, and it was published by Boa through the same process. So I did just want to, I, I feel like you might have some interesting thoughts on this just from, from what I went through too. So can you sort of walk us through the path this book took from manuscript on your computer to this finished product that I'm holding in my hand right now, uh, broadly. Yeah, well, you know, like I said, it started out with the three stories. By the time the three stories were published, I felt like, well, there is more to this than, uh, than just these three stories. So also, you know, I don't, I, I don't throw stuff away. There are writers who throw stuff away. I, don't, I never threw anything away. You know, all this, if you look at my desktop, it's really horrible to look at because everything is inundated with stuff that I started. And for some reason, I'm also able to remember most of the stuff that I've done before, even if I don't use them. Okay, so, you know, um, I, I think the uh, summarizer calls it the construction site of the imagination. Mine is always like littered with things that are left behind. So I have those things, I have those stories. So the moment the three were done and published, I also began to think of the leftovers from my past life, my writing, you know, that I can add to, that I could add to, to the collection. But I also began to write uh, the other stories and they came, they came very quickly. They came very quickly because it was a time that was kind of fraught. Uh, it was a time that I was waiting to hear back on this novel that I was, that I poured my heart and soul into, you know, so this kind of really gave me something to, to do, something to distract me, something to, so that's how I wrote a lot of the stories really quickly. They came very quickly. The first draft came very quickly. So by the time the, I saw that I had a collection, that I had a book length, you know, which was about 150 pages, um, you know, I just thought, oh, this is book length. I don't, I don't really write the, those long books. So uh, that's when I began the process of putting them together. Okay, so I began to gather them from different places and put them together. And then I began to ask myself, what other, uh, what kind of stuff from my uh, other pieces of writing that I haven't used fits this theme? So I still have like three or four that came from all of that that went into this. Okay, so when that was done, um, ordinarily I would have sent the collection to my agent and said, I have a collection. But remember, she's still hawking around this novel. Okay, and so she wasn't very open to sending a book of stories to publishers who had not responded. Okay, so that was, it just so happened that I knew Boa when I was at Syracuse because um, a classmate of mine had done an internship there. So Boa and Syracuse have this relationship where someone in the MFA program goes to Boa to do a publishing internship. Okay. So I'd heard about them, but I knew that they didn't publish fiction, you know, that they published poetry. But then for some reason, I think over that period, somewhere on the internet, I stumbled upon Boa Short Fiction Prize. And then I said, oh, I know this publisher, you know, I know that someone who was uh, in my class did an internship with them. Do they publish fiction now? So I went on the website and saw it. And of course I said, oh, I have to edit this collection and send it to them. So I did, that mm -hmm. was it. And, uh, you know, I really, I'm really thankful. I really am thankful that it, it was a lifesaver because it just kept me busy. And I didn't worry so much about the novel being sold or not being sold anymore. Yeah. And then of I'll, course, you know, I got the call that it had won. Yeah, and I'll just say too, that uh, for those who don't know Boa, Boa is a 
kind of legendary poetry press. I mean, there's amazing, I mean, outstanding list of poets that have come from BOA. Yeah, I, I'm humbled to be published by this press because of the names that are, are on the list alongside mine. I am not deserving of that in the least. So um, speaking of BOA though, BOA's current editor is Peter Connors. Yeah. And you've also though worked with a couple other editors and I've worked with one more now too. So I just wonder, how did this editorial process work with Peter and how did it differ from your other editorial process? Sort of thinking in terms of our guests here on the event, just sort of sharing the range of editorial processes is that there's not a single way this occurs. Yeah, it's very different. I mean, my first, let me say that my first two books were published by one of the big major publishers, you know, I don't need to call their name. Like there are only five major publishers now. So, um, but I'll tell you something. I really appreciate working with a smaller press. I'll give you one, just one example. When I, uh, when the cover design for my first book collection of stories was shown to me, I said I didn't like it. And you know, this was from the big major publisher. And I remember my, uh, I, I told my agent I didn't like it. I remember telling my editor I didn't like it. You know, and uh, they, my editor said, "Oh, I'll talk to the design person." And then got back to me and said, you know what the design person said? I said, no, he said, when you see it, you'll like it in person. I still don't. You know, I said, you'll like it in person. I still don't. I don't, you know, I don't like it in person at all. You know, this is a hardback. Of course, eventually, um, when we did the paperback, the paperback was friendlier uh, than this really green, angry colored thing. So that was that. Whereas with Boa, I, you know, we played around with a lot of design ideas that I had coming from an advertising background. Uh, but, you know, they, they didn't quite take just my idea. There was something I said that the graphic design person, uh, I think, uh, the Sandy Knight said, well, we're going to incorporate that thing that you said, we'll incorporate it into it. So you see this tiny alien here. That was from one of my ideas, and she found a way to put it in here. So it was very different. Um, so with the also with the major big publisher, the top five, the editorial process was very different. It was more like um, my former editor will write was very good at writing editorial an editorial letter that was probably like six or seven or eight pages, where he gives you an overview of what he thinks about the work and just lets you do the work. Okay, so that's very different. Peter was very hands-on, you know, um, hands-on as in using a pen to mark up things and ask questions. There was, there was no page that escaped, you know, asking questions on every page. So first I found that uh, a little bit intimidating until I embraced it, you know, and then when I embraced it, it worked better for me, you know. So that was, that was uh, also a different uh, approach to to editing. So I just felt like, you know, the smaller publisher was more intimate, more interested, more hands-on, you know. Um, and, um, you know, my, my former editor had also an assistant editor who kind of, and then there was a copy editor and there was all of that. So there was this hierarchy of people you had to deal with, but he did the big thing, you know, the sign off on the big projects. You read the editorial letter and get to work. Um, mm -hmm. Was there anything in this manuscript in particular that Peter's, like a, a particular memory of something that Peter suggested that you changed, that you felt made a story or the some some aspect of the collection stronger? Is there a particular example? Of something that made it stronger? Yeah. From he was, he was, uh, Peter was always using the phrase uh, clarity, make clearer what you mean here. You lost the here, make, make clearer, you know, clarity. Uh, what do you mean here? So that, that was something that was very useful. So I kind of had to cut and cut and cut. Okay. Uh, but to, to the question, there, there was also stuff that I didn't, I wasn't happy that he asked me to do, mm -hmm. which looking back now, I probably shouldn't have done. Uh, especially because, you know, I also write for the most part for my Nigerian audience. And one of the things I'd used was uh, something that is, usually referred to as pidgin English. Mm -hmm. Some will refer to it as broken English. Uh, it's like a Nigerian patwa. Okay. Uh, I use quite a lot of it 
in the stories, in some of the stories, especially the ones that are set, um, uh, that should be one P, um, that are set in Nigeria. But, you know, it's, for the sake of clarity, I did cut a lot of them. I don't, I don't know that they, they feature as much as they did in my first collection. And looking back now, I believe that I should have just left them there because, you know, it's part of who I am. I, I think it's important to note that because most editors are like, they may fight you on some things, but if you believe in something strongly, strongly I mean, in my case, there's a single sentence I wish I hadn't changed in my collection. There's one time he, I just, I like agreed with like everything he said. And there was one, like, I should not have agreed with. It's like, <laughs> I understand where he was coming from. He wasn't necessarily wrong in his thought, but I liked the original sentence. It was just a, a word order. And the original sentence was very deliberate and less transparent. It was, it was more obvious prose, but yeah. So uh, uh, you're allowed to stick to your guns. I think that's sometimes what writers don't know when they get to their first editor that you can, you can say no once in a while, as long as you're a generous, thoughtful responder, they're not going to be mad if you disagree. Oh, yeah, that's, that's true. That's true. Um, yeah. The, the thing is that the best editors usually couch uh, these in terms of, in terms of suggestions. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know, what do you think? Uh, would you, you know, would you look at this? Would you consider doing this? I think those are really like the most interesting, but of course there are editors that use what I call slash and bone approach, which is like, woo, 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 you know, that, that too. That too is something that, you know, sometimes the work is much better. Sometimes the work is uh, unrecognizable as your own work. Mm -hmm. you know, but, you know, uh, the thing again to have at the back of your mind, which really helped me to navigate this was that I said, these people have the best interest of my work at heart. Otherwise mm -hmm. they wouldn't have picked it and they want to publish it and they want it to do well. So listen to them, you know. Uh, listen to them. Don't sell your soul, but listen to them. Maybe they have something yeah. good they want to suggest. Yeah, I love that. So I'm going to turn to the chat window real quick because you have a couple questions. And just a reminder to everyone that if you have any questions, please type them in the chat window and I will get to as many as we can. And so this is sort of, I think, a broad writing career question. We covered that a little bit when you introduced yourself. Do you remember a point when you knew you found your own voice as a writer did it happen slowly or did you just have it from day one when you decided to start turning to creative writing from the advertising? I didn't have it from day one. I, I didn't have it from day one. And even when I had it, I didn't identify it. I think it's probably a couple of people who said, oh, this, this sounds very distinct. But I also, I've also known that I gravitated to writers who had like a singular vision, uh, who had like this particular way of looking at the world. It wasn't the voice. I was, you know, I've all, always liked uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez. And one of the most influential works on this book is a story collection of his called uh, Leafstone, where you have two stories uh, in which, you know, a man washes up from the sea and he's embraced. It's called the most handsome drowned man in the world. And in this little community, they kind of embrace him and give him, they call him Esteban and give him all sorts of names and give him all kinds of powerful attributes. And then in the other story, uh, an old, it's called a very old man with enormous wings, washes up, who's supposed to be an angel, but it's not quite an angel. His wings are not white, they are not clean. He's kind of run down, decrepit, and, but he does miracles, but they're not really great miracles, you know, and all of that. But I, I've always felt like you can't come away from reading the first line of 100 Years of Solitude without feeling like this guy is speaking in a way that no one else speaks. You know, even though it's originally written in Spanish, that sentence where he says, uh, as he stood before the firing squad, he remembered when his father, the, the first day he discovered ice or something. It just spoke to me in a very distinct, in a very distinct way. And again, because I was coming from um, a tradition of oral storytelling, which is quite different. You know, I tell my friends here that when you think of stories, you think of sitting in a classroom before your teacher and she's reading from a book. But when I think of stories, I think of sitting in front of my grandmother, not even sitting. That didn't, there didn't have to be an occasion. She could just tell you a story to warn you to always shut the door or something. It was, you know, part of growing up. So it was very oral. And I began, I also realized that in oral storytelling, 
you gravitated towards those who had a more interesting way of telling stories. You know, then you gravitated towards, even though they are working basically with the same template. Uh, most of African oral stories are basically the same. You know, how the tortoise uh, got those cracks on its carapace, you know, uh, why the vulture is a greedy animal, you know, why the mosquito disturbs the ear, you know, and all of that. So as far as I was concerned, it was this distinct way of telling the same story, you know. So that was something that I thought about a lot. Um, how am I going to tell my story in this very distinct way that is peculiarly mine? So I have a, a new question in the chat I'm going to go to real quick. And it's, I, I, this is a fascinating question. And so I hope you find that that way too, is how would you describe the main substance and value uh, of what you got from your very impressive MFA professors, inspiration, encouragement, particular editorial perspectives, craft, et cetera. It's such a mystery for those of, uh, for those of us outside of MFA programs. For me, it's very different though. Uh, one is that I came to the MFA program at a much older age than most people would. I didn't, I was, I was, I didn't just graduate. I worked, you know, for in advertising for years and rose to senior management before. I, so it's, it's very different for me. But one of the things that I gained from the MFA program is the books and authors that I read while I was in the program that I was introduced to. It wasn't, it wasn't really what, you know, there were writers that I'd read a lot before I came, but there were writers that I, I'd never heard about, and then it was in the MFA program that I read about them, read those collections. You know, Amy Hempel was very good at introducing writers that you've never heard about, but who are really great and distinct. So yes, that was, oh, oh, I'm so sorry. Someone says, okay, I'll just increase the volume of my microphone. I, I hope you can hear me now. So, um, you know, being introduced to all those writers was really helpful. That was the one thing, okay? Writers that I would never have read about. And the other thing was that there were also a couple of professors who kind of really were not ashamed to show you their battle scars. You know, I think that was also very helpful. Um, but many, there was, there was a poet who was always submitting work, even though he had published like half a dozen books. But he was all he was a professor, but he was almost always submitting work. That always surprised me, his humility in doing that, you know, always submitting work and getting rejections, even though he had published six books. I found that really strange. He was always he's published in a bunch of places, but he was always someone who was enthusiastic about writing and hunger to publish. So that humility was also something that um, I admired. I, I I think that was the new books, the new authors, and then just the fact that, you know, many of these professors had also gone through what you were going through and they were happy to share those stories with you. That was it. I, I'd never thought of that before, how important being introduced, like an author who knows enough writers, enough about the literary world to recommend authors that they think might be meaningful to you. Yes. And I had never really thought of that concretely before, but that's absolutely so important. How many times at a workshop setting, a summer workshop or whatever, someone said, hey, check out this, you might like it. And I liked it and it was important to me. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I'll particularly remember Amy Hempel, you know, Walter Kern, she, um, she also recommended a guy called, a book that is not read anymore, it's by a guy called Joe Bernard, which is just a book titled I Remember, in which he just remembers stuff. You know, I remember being this, I remember being that. That was, that's the entire book. I could never, I'd never heard of it. I'd never, I read it, she, she introduced that. And a bunch of uh, other writers, uh, Mark Richard, who I love his short stories. All these were writers I read about in grad school, and that really helped to kind of expand my mind and expand my world. That's great. Um, there's one more question that goes back a little bit to our putting a the series of questions about putting a collection together. So just the first concrete question is how many stories are in this collection? How many stories? Yeah, how many? Quite a, quite a few stories, uh, 18. 18? Yeah, I think I had 17 in mind. So yeah. You know, sure. it, yeah, that's that's that should be it. You know, I'm not I, I really don't believe in overstaying my welcome as a story writer. I just like to tell the story and make way for someone else. So yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So yeah, I mean, um, there are writers who would write a short story and it's 39, 40 pages and I've always wondered, you know, just get with the program, write the novel. <laughs> Yeah, so but they they for you're the, almost there. You're almost there. Just you're going. almost there. Yeah, yeah. That's the first quarter is gone. So just push ahead, you know. But for me, it's it's re really never more than ten, twelve pages. Yeah. Uh, and the second part of this question was, do you really? I mean, I think you answered this about the stories. Did you you answer the consideration of the length? But did you have sort of like a goal length for a collection? Was this just like this? Did you? Have a minimum number of pages you were aiming for, or was this just what you had? And that, that, just, happened. that just happened, you know. Yeah. By the time I hit 150, I knew that you know this this could work as a book. Um, uh, so here's an interesting question. So, when you're writing your characters, do you write characters that are very different from yourself? And if so, how do you? Can you say something about how you do that process? Yeah, I, you know, for my first collection, if you read the first collection, Voice of America, there are a lot of characters in the story that are, were very much like me. Um, an immigrant, uh, you know, trying to, to um, find his feet or trying to find, get acclimatized, overcome culture shock, overcome weather shock, you know, find himself in this place that is unaccustomed, you know, and trying to uh, kind of get adapt to this new ecology. But all that I told myself completely, there is a musician from Nigeria that I admire so much. His name is Fela Kuti. You should check him out. And Fela Kuti, once he releases an album, he never plays the song again. And I've always been fascinated by that. And for this collection, I really wanted to move away from what I did with the first collection. You know, so if you read, there are two totally different things. I kind of tell myself, I, I want to do something different. I want to do something new here. So in this collection, I don't write myself as much as I did in the first, in the earlier collection. So I, that, that maybe leads to one of another series of questions I had for you. And that was sort of on minimalism mm -hmm. and minimalist prose. I, I skipped over some questions I had about fantastical writing and that there are some fantastical elements, some speculative science fictional elements in this. And that's just, so while the stories are grounded by these fantastical conceits, um, not all of them, many of them have literal aliens or something like that going on. The language in some of them tends to be very straightforward, almost minimalistic at times. And you don't dive into the details of say these aliens. So I, as a reader, viewed them, I guess, from a distance. I was never like up close and personal inspecting tentacles or whatever aspect of alien uh, aliens you might go you, you might be looking at. So why did you choose that sparse style when writing these subjects? You know, I'm more interested in the complexity of ideas than in the complexity of expression. I'm really more interested in how the ideas that you express are complex and make would make the Reader think and reflect after they leave the story, much more than you know. At some point, um, you know, I found myself in the story called uh, Alien and Actors. I found myself uh, doing a lot of word building, and I kind of kicked myself uh, and said, "Look, you are just uh, you're not a member of this club. You're a guest in this club. Don't forget that." I kind of reminded myself, "I'm not doing the sword and sorcery. I'm not doing the." Uh, the kind of space opera <laughs> science fiction writing. I'm just using it as something, as a kind of, uh, as a kind of uh, uh, thing with which to build my story. Okay, but that's not the main thing that I'm doing. I've always been fascinated by people who are referred to as minimalists. You know, Carver, for instance, who was also taught at Syracuse and who I read both his poetry and his fiction. Um, how much. He was out, he was more interested in the idea expressed than in the language of with which you express the idea. So I really think that again, that being succinct is more of where maybe it's the oral tra uh, storytelling tradition again. It's more like being succinct and to the point very quickly, you know, than just uh, the plain plain with language. I, I think that I want people to read this. The language is fairly straightforward, but what are the ideas? You know, how 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 is it? Take a story, for instance. Uh, 
uh, take a story from, for instance, where uh, a kind of an alien spaceship lands in a village and disrupts the existing order. And for the, for the first time, it's viewed as something that has brought good fortune and luck, okay? And then after a while, it's viewed as uh, something that has brought bad luck to the community. And they wonder what they are going to do to do to it. Okay, so the question now becomes, what does this mean? You know, um, how do we view, okay, I see a lovely cat in the background there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, hi, there's a story about a cat in this story. Uh, uh, so maybe the cat knows that there is a short story here about a about cat, but not a very nice cat. Anyway, so, <laughs> all right. So the, the question becomes, when you leave that story, you of course know that this story is speaking to many issues. That this story is speaking to, to many issues. Is there a time that uh, immigrants or aliens as viewed, are viewed as people who can work and create wealth and help the society and bring all these kinds of wonderful cuisine that we so love and that we love to eat. But then at some point we believe that they are a burden and they are leeches and they are moochers and they are sucking and taking life out of our society. You know, so that for me, it's not really the story, it's about the complexity of the idea. When you leave the story, uh, the story doesn't leave you. That's what I want to achieve. And, and just so you know, the cat, he hopped down now, but he flipped around and immediately nuzzled your book. So he sounds... <laughs> the... <laughs> you know, they're, they, they're very instinctive. They know, they know stuff, yeah. Um, are, are there any different, because when I sent this line of questions, I had actually, I sent you questions earlier this week. There were still a couple stories I hadn't read. And the story, the, the few stories at the very end of the book are, you know, not, I'm going to say a dense style, but they're not quite as sparse as some of the really, the earlier alien stories and the ones that really, uh, I think embody that idea of alien stories with the, the sci-fi element. Yeah. Um, so I'm not going to, I do know you work in slightly denser prose at least, mm -hmm. but what are the difficulties in working in and especially revising sparse minimalist prose where there's not a lot going on. It yeah. seems like it's all there to be seen if a reader chooses to see it. And that would scare me. That would scare me a lot to write, write with that little, I feel like I have sleight of hand sometimes. I can distract a reader away from maybe mm -hmm. something weaker or something that's not quite founded, but with sparse prose, it's all right there. Yeah, that's true. The, I mean, I admire like Saunders, like you mentioned, you know, who spent, you know, building this world and building, uh, that's, that's interesting, but it's not something that, I, you know, again, I'm a writer who leans on my strengths. I like to do what I'm capable of doing, what I'm best at doing. The, the other thing, again, is that I tend to have a problem that other writers don't have. Most writers um, kind of write a 45 page story and then they have to cut, 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 cut. In my, I have the reverse, I, I have the reverse problem. I have to add, add, add. You know, I, I tend to add. Some people just cut, 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 and then they manage to, uh, to, to weed it down to maybe 15 pages. Whereas I start probably with nine, and then I just need to add, I need to add. Um, I need to go to this scene, which is probably what you see in my work. I need to go to the scene and say, what happened here? Is there something that is missing in this scene? You know, so that's, that's, that's the way I work, and that's what has worked for me. That's really great. So, I mean, I feel like we're right at the end of our hour here. So I just want to thank you so much for, for chatting with me, for sharing this with all our, our guests. That was uh, fantastic. I feel like I, I feel like I always like it when I feel like I learn a lot. So that if I feel that way, I'm sure that we had a, a good audience experience too. So EC, thank you so much for joining us. Everyone, please go buy a copy of Alien Stories by EC Osandu. It's a wonderful story collection from a wonderful publisher. So uh, we just put the links back in the, win in the chat window to do that. So thank you all for coming. Thank you, EC, so much for joining us. Thank you. And thank you for all the people who came... Um... You know, those who sent the uh, direct messages, pleased to meet you, uh, someone from my continent, someone who worked in Nigeria. That's really nice. That's I'm very excited to have met everyone. And I'm sure a couple of people also tuned in from Nigeria. And it's where it's almost like 2 a.m. now. And mm -hmm. that's a huge sacrifice. And the person from Barcelona, thank you. I know you're on a different time zone. I just thank everyone. Thank you. It's been fantastic. And Zach, thank you for having me. I appreciate the Writers' Center.